This morning, the Lord has been on the move through His Holy Spirit, revealing more than you can imagine. And I have pieced these little things together to try to put them together in this video. I may have to make more than one video because the battery runs down and I need to recharge it. So please bear with me. I'm about to show you some things that are going to blow your mind. Did John the Baptist foretell something in the future as a prophet of God? He was considered the greatest, the precursor to the Messiah, Jesus. Listen to what he said. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, listen, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Revelation 20.10 And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, the king, and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Daniel 7.11 then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast, king, was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. A tree and its fruit, Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Now these are two things in the parable of the trees. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Isaiah thirty-seven nineteen, They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Ezekiel 15, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood, the vine branch which is among the trees of the forest? Is wood taken from it to make any object, or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on? Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it and its middle is burned. Is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it, and it is burned? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus I will make the land desolate because they have acted unfaithfully, declares the Lord God. When I get to the end of this, I am going to reveal something incredible about the parable of the fig tree and all the trees. And it is stunning. But before I get there, I've got to share this with you, which is incredible. Now this is pertaining to 
King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla, who will be anointed behind a specially created screen of fine embroidery held by poles hewn from an ancient wind-blown Windsor oak, and that would be a royal oak, and mounted with eagles cast in bronze and gilded in gold leaf, Buckingham Palace has announced. I want to show you a picture of this screen that is going to be hiding the king and queen consort in the anointing ceremony. The screen has an embroidered tree, which I assume to be the royal English oak tree. It's got angels blowing trumpets and a dove at the top of the tree. But now, down near the root of the tree is the king's royal cipher. Whew. Near the root of the tree. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. If a tree does not bear good fruit, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist foreshadowed this royal ceremony 2,000 years ago. It didn't just mean what it meant to those people at that time, but prophetic utterances about the restoration of Israel's monarchy and the restoration of a king on a throne in the last days. The royal cipher of King Charles III is down near the root of the tree, at the base of the trunk of the tree. Have a look. The royal cipher is right here. Right, this is it, right here. Here is the royal cipher at the base of the tree. The royal English oak tree, keep that in mind. And this saying, I will read to you what it is about. They will also be coronated and anointed at that part of the ceremony. They will wear crimson and purple robes. And this is what they look like. What does it really mean to bring forth good fruit? It really means to take the gospel of the Lord, the one true God of Israel, to the world so that they may be saved and given salvation. The gospel message of the second perfect Adam, the Lord coming in a body prepared so that the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah would take us back to the Garden of Eden-like state through the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it has been released, the liturgy of the coronation ceremony, and this is what's going to happen, the procession of faith leaders and representatives of faith communities will be in King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla's coronation. Faith leaders and representatives from the Jewish, Sunni, and Shia Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, 
Baha'i, and Zoroastrian communities will be part of the procession into Westminster Abbey. This represents the multi-faith nature of our society and the importance of inclusion of other faiths whilst respecting the integrities of the different traditions. This is what is going to be in the ceremony, in the procession, the cross with the splinters supposedly from the true cross, which actually may be a royal oak, which is the king of trees. On the Shroud of Turin, I remember reading in a book, The DNA of God, the author's name was, his last name was Garza. He had said that they found a sliver of oak on the back side where the cross would have been. Now, they would take out the shroud and hold it up and people would lay, you know, objects on it. So the sliver of oak could have come from that over the centuries before they even saw the positive image of the crucified man on it. For centuries they never saw that. It wasn't until the late 1800s that the first photographer, Segundo Pia, he took the first camera photo, absolutely shocked when that face appeared in the dark room. He almost dropped the glass plate. I want you to remember that Israel is looking for the anointed one, an earthly king, somebody that's a military man. I want you to know that His Majesty the King is head of the armed forces and he was accompanied by Her Majesty the Queen Consort presented new standards and colors to the Royal Navy, the lifeguards of the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment, the King's Company of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards and the King's Color Squadron of the Royal Air Force and he was at this ceremony some time ago and they have this thing called Trooping the Guard where they have you know them all on horseback and it's really neat they actually have a set of timpani on horseback that a timpanist is playing and that's what I played in orchestra so it always gets my attention but just think of that that the king is the head of the armed forces and he's also head of state. This is why I told you that I realized that the one who had the deadly wound by a sword and yet lived is not a future event. God brought a sword against his people, the monarchy of Judah and Israel, and that deadly wound will be healed when Israel reestablishes the Davidic throne and sets this last earthly king on the throne before Jesus comes to reign. They also held a service at Westminster Abbey. It was... Um, to mark the arrival of the Stone of Destiny at Westminster Abbey. They just had that take place when the stone arrived from Scotland. They will put it underneath the coronation chair in the slot so that he will be coronated sitting upon the supposed Jacob's pillow Jacob's pillar stone and at the time of this anointing ceremony they will put on these robes of scarlet and purple crimson and purple so even though I want you to remember the royal oak because I'm going to be talking a lot about that I showed you the royal oaks that were ancient in Glastonbury called Gog and Magog and they are represented in the ancient 2,000 year old trees called Gog Magog in England and the king has these wind-blown royal oak poles with the eagles at the top holding 
the three-sided screen that was specially designed. This is a redesign. It's not the hoopa type canopy that was held over the queen. It's a three-sided screen. And I'm going to get into that here in a moment. This liturgy has been released, and these are the actual words that the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to say to King Charles. Your Majesty, the church established by law, whose settlement you have sworn to maintain, is committed to the true profession of the gospel, and in so doing will seek to foster an environment in which people of all faiths and beliefs may live freely. The coronation oath has stood for centuries and is enshrined in law. Are you willing to take the oath? The king will say, I am willing. The king places his hand on the Bible and the archbishop administers the oath. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, your other realms and the territories to any of them belonging or pertaining according to their respective laws and customs? The king will say, I solemnly promise so to do. Will you, to your power, cause law and justice in mercy to be executed in all your judgments? And the king says, I will. Archbishop of Canterbury says, Will you to the utmost of your power maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you to the utmost of your power maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law? Will you maintain and preserve inviolably the settlement of the Church of England and the doctrine, worship, and discipline of the government thereof, as by law established in England? Will you preserve unto the bishops and clergy of England and to the churches there committed to their charge all such rights and privileges as by law do or shall appertain to them or any of them? And the king says, All this I promise to do, the things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep. The king says, I, Charles, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify, and declare that I am a faithful Protestant and that I will, according to the true intent of the enactments which secure the Protestant succession to the throne, uphold and maintain the said enactments to the best of my powers according to law. And a short anthem is sung during the signing of the oath. The king's prayer will say, from the king, God of compassion and mercy, whose son was sent not to be served, but to serve. Give grace that I may find in my service perfect freedom, and in that freedom knowledge of thy truth. Grant that I may be a blessing to all thy children of every faith and conviction, that together we may discover the ways of gentleness and be led into the paths of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is not accepting of all of these false gods and religions. God wants us to depart from evil and bear fruit from the tree of life. We have the Hindu Prime Minister. He's going to read the reading taken from the first chapter of the Epistle to the Colossians, beginning at the ninth verse. And it says this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
strengthened with all might according to his glorious power into all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now back to the holy anointing, the screen that was created Buckingham Palace said it was historically regarded as a moment of the anointing they're talking about between the sovereign and God with the screen there to protect its sanctity. Previously, it was a canopy over the top, which actually didn't provide real privacy. It was more figurative, said Nick Gutfreund, who designed and created the frame. Now this three-sided screen provides absolute privacy. There had been speculation Charles might allow people to see the anointing, but royal historian Professor Kate Williams said that that would have been a surprise. It's not going to be the design of the wedding hoopa. And what is the symbolism of a hoopa? Like many elements of a Jewish wedding, it is beautifully symbolic and symbolizes the home that the couple will build together in their married life and is open on all sides like the biblical tent of Abraham and Sarah, signifying that everyone is welcome and that everyone will be treated hospitably. So it was designed to where you could see from every side. And so it's been changed from a canopy into a three-sided screen where you can see nothing. The hoopa also symbolizes the groom's home and the bride's new domain. More specifically, the hoopa symbolizes the bridal chamber where the marital act was consummated in ancient times. So under the hoopa, there is the king and he is given the ring where he's married to the people and the land. The primary requirement for a chuppah in Jewish law is that it be supported by four poles open on four sides and covered above. As you incorporate these basic requirements, the sky is the limit. Decorate it with grapevines, drape it with lace, use branches from a favorite tree to serve as chuppah poles. The seven blessings, or Shiva Brachot, as they're called in Hebrew, are the heart of the Jewish wedding ceremony. Seven different blessings are bestowed upon the couple when they are standing under the chuppah. They may be given by the officiant, the rabbi, or cantor, or friends and family members. As I said, that the ancient rabbis compared the hupa to the tent of Abraham found in the biblical story. Abraham was famed for his hospitality. His tent had entrances on all four sides so that travelers coming from any direction would have a door to enter. But at this coronation ceremony, it's all going to be blocked off to everyone's view. In the past, the hupa was made often draped over a couple's shoulders during the ceremony instead of being held by posts. This practice is still part of the Sephardic tradition, but not the Ashkenazi tradition. When the parents of the couple drape a tallit over the couple's heads or shoulders before the blessing, so they would use a prayer shawl. The chuppah meaning has changed over time. To some, it represents the presence of God presiding over the union or a home with open walls to allow love and faith to flow freely within the marriage. Here is a hoopa in Washington, D.C.
And after that, I'm going to show you the anointing canopy of Queen Elizabeth II that looked like the Jewish wedding hoopa. Now remember I told you that in Lamentations it talks about the ancient monarchy, it talks about Judah and Israel, and it talks about that God was going to bring a sword against the ancient monarchy. It says that they were clothed in purple and scarlet, that they were raised in purple and scarlet. They, Jerusalem, are Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, because she played the harlot, the ancient monarchy played the harlot and the people against God. God said it himself. So in the last days, we've got the scarlet harlot as the restored monarchy and putting a new king on the throne of David, which I believe will likely be this one seen as the anointed one. The chupa is a canopy under which a Jewish couple stand during their wedding ceremony. It consists of a cloth or sheet, sometimes a tallit stretched or supported over four poles, or sometimes manually held up by attendants to the ceremony. A chuppah symbolizes the home that the couple will build together. You have to hear this, though. In a spiritual sense, the covering of the chuppah represents the presence of God over the covenant of marriage. So this redesign does not incorporate the chupa that represents the presence of God over the covenant of this marriage of the king to his land. So the wedding chupa being representative of the presence of God over the covenant of marriage is as the kippah that they wear on their skull here served as a reminder of the Creator above all, also a symbol of separation from God, so the chupa was erected to signify that the ceremony and institution of marriage has divine origins. And this is actually from the Royal.UK website about the anointing screen. Now it's been changed from the chupa to a three-sided screen. The anointing screen, which has been designed and produced for use during the coronation service on the 6th of May at Westminster Abbey, has been blessed at a special service of dedication at the Chapel Royal St. James's Palace. The blessing follows a private visit by their majesties, the king and the queen consort, to the Royal School of Needlework to view the anointing screen's progress and to meet the craftspeople and embroiders who contributed to the project as Duchess of Cornwall, Her Majesty the Queen Consort, became patron of the Royal School of Needlework in 2017. The anointing screen has been designed and produced for use at the most sacred moment of the coronation, the anointing of His Majesty the King. The screen combines traditional and contemporary sustainable embroidery practices to produce a design which speaks to His Majesty the King's deep affection for the Commonwealth. The screen has been gifted for the occasion by the City of London Corporation, the City Livery Companies. The anointing takes place before the investiture and crowning of His Majesty. The Dean of Westminster pours holy oil from the ampulla into the coronation spoon, which I showed you in previous videos, and the Archbishop of Canterbury anoints the sovereign on the hands, chest, and head. It has been historically regarded as a moment between the sovereign and God with a screen or canopy in place given the sanctity of the anointing. The king's royal cipher is positioned at the base of the tree, representing the sovereign as servant of their people. Remember that the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and any tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire according to John the Baptist. 
Remember, I told you that I had the dream of the king's royal cipher being the mark of the beast. A beast is a king, according to the prophet Daniel. There's a lot of new people that come and look at the video, so I have to repeat this. So that means the king's royal cipher is at the base near the roots of the tree. Don't you think that's a little bit hair-raising and profound? The anointing screen was designed by iconographer Aiden Hart and brought to life through both hand and digital embroidery managed by the Royal School of Needlework. The central design takes the form of a tree, which includes 56 representing the 56 member countries of the Commonwealth. This is really interesting. I just looked up in the Strong's Concordance just to see what number 56 was in the Greek and Hebrew, just to see what it says. And it's interesting, in Greek, it's a word, ignosia, meaning ignorance, specifically willful ignorance. Could you say that about adding all of these faiths to the gospel, which is the one true God of Israel? That's ignorance. Hebrew, number 56, is ebal, which means to mourn. It means caused lamentations. It's interesting because I told you in the book of Revelation, when Mystery Babylon is saying, I sit a queen and am no widow, I will see no mourning. This was the ancient monarchy of Israel and Judah who said this. Once it said something in Lamentations about woe to the lowly city who once sat a queen but is now a widow. She's lamenting because she was taken to Babylon. And here she is in Revelation saying, I will see no lamentation. But this king rules and this word means mourn, cause lamentations. Grieve, lament, mourn, pretend to be a mourner, went into mourning. What did the Lord say? But my people perish for lack of knowledge. And this word 56 in agnosia means want of knowledge, ignorance, willful ignorance. So by bringing all these faiths together into one, this is willful ignorance because he knows the truth and is claiming to uphold that while dragging anyone of any faith, even none, into it, even atheists. So let me restate, the central design takes the form of a tree, more than likely the Royal English Oak Tree, which is the king of trees. The central design takes the form of a tree which includes 56 representing the 56 member countries of the Commonwealth. Does this mean they're going to go into mourning and lamentation? Israel's going to go into mourning and lamentation during the time of Jacob's trouble when this king sits on Jacob's pillar and is coronated upon it? The king's royal cipher is positioned at the base of the tree, representing the sovereign as the servant of their people. The design is being selected personally by the king and is inspired by the stained glass sanctuary window in the chapel royal at St. James's Palace, which was gifted by the livery companies to mark the Golden Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II in 2002. The anointing screen is supported by a wooden pole framework designed and created by Nick Gutfreund of the Worshipful Company of Carpenters. The oak wooden poles are made from a windblown tree from the Windsor Estate, which was originally planted by the Duke of Northumberland in 1765. The wooden poles have been 
limed and waxed, combining traditional craft skills with a contemporary finish. That means that the poles that have the eagles on the top, that'll be lifted up, I suppose, they are from an ancient windblown royal English oak tree. At the top of the wooden poles, these royal oak poles, are mounted two eagles cast in bronze, gilded in gold leaf, giving the screens a total height of 2.6 meters and width of 2.2 meters. The form of an eagle has long-standing associations with the coronations. Eagles have appeared on previous coronation canopies, including the canopy used by Queen Elizabeth in 1953, which I showed you. Equally, the ampulla, which carries the chrism oil used for anointing, is cast in the shape of an eagle which I showed you in previous videos. The screen is three-sided with the open side to face the high altar at Westminster Abbey. The two sides of the screen feature a much simpler design with maroon fabric and a gold, blue, and red cross inspired by the colors and patterning of the Cosmati pavement at Westminster Abbey where the anointing will take place. The crosses were also embroidered by the Royal School of Needlework studio team. At the coronation service, the anointing screen will be held by service personnel from regiments of the household division holding the freedom of the City of London. The city of London is where they have the effigies of Gog and Magog statues. The three sides of the screen will be borne by a trooper and guardsman from each of the lifeguards, Grenadier Guards, Coldstream Guards, Scots Guards, Irish Guards, and Welsh Guards. The screen has been gifted for the coronation by the City of London Corporation and participating livery companies, the city's ancient and modern trade guilds. So that's the Royal Guild Hall where those statues I showed you, the effigies of Gog and Magog are. And they bring them out when they have the Lord Mayor's parade and they bring out these statues of Gog and Magog and the ancient... English royal oaks that I showed you, the trees that are 2,000 years old that are Gog and Magog. And uh, I believe it was Gog that caught on fire and burned, but it's still standing. His Majesty the King is a keen advocate and supporter of the preservation of heritage craft skills and the anointing screen project has been a collaboration of these specialists in traditional crafts from those early in their careers to artisans with many years of experience. The individual leaves have been embroidered by staff and students from the Royal School of Needlework as well as members of the worshipful company of broiders, drapers, and weavers. as well as heritage craft, contemporary skills and techniques have formed part of this unique collaboration. The outline of the tree has been created using digital machine embroidery by Digitech Embroidery. This machine embroidery was completed with sustainable thread. Madeira Sensa made from 100% Lyocell fibers. The threads used by the Royal School of Needlework are from their famous wall of wool and existing supplies that have been collated over the years through past projects and donations. The materials used to create the anointing screen have also been sourced sustainably from across the UK and other Commonwealth nations. The cloth is made of wool from Australia and New Zealand, woven and finished in UK mills. 
The script used for the names of each Commonwealth country has been designed as modern and classical, inspired by both the Roman Trojan column letters and the work of Welsh calligrapher David Jones. Also forming part of the Commonwealth tree are the King's Royal Cipher, decorative roses, and angels with trumpets, and a scroll which features the quote from Julian of Norwich in circa 1343 to 1416. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. At the top of the screen is the sun, representing God, and birds, including the dove of peace, which have all been hand-embroidered by the Royal School of Needlework. The dedication and blessing of the anointing screen took place earlier this week at the Chapel Royal St. James's Palace, where it was officially received and blessed by the sub-dean and domestic chaplain to the king, Paul Wright, on behalf of the royal household. When the queen was coronated, following the oath, the queen removed the crimson parliamentary robe and was seated under a canopy of cloth of gold held by four knights of the garter on St. Edward's coronation chair. The chair contained the ancient stone of Schoon, the stone of destiny, captured by Edward I in 1296 and used at every coronation since 1626. The Archbishop of Canterbury then anointed the Queen the central and most sacred act of the ceremony. It is during this act that the choir sings the anthem, Zadok the Priest, which speaks about the anointing specifically by Zadok the priest of King Solomon sitting on Jacob's pillow, his pillar stone, which his name is Israel. And that's the piece that I played for you previously a long time ago by Handel, which was written for the coronation of George II in 1727. The canopy that Queen Elizabeth II was seated beneath was a cloth of gold supported by the four knights of the garter during the anointing of the new monarch. The Bishop of Durham and the Bishop of Bath and Wells stand on either side of the image. This first part is a warning from John the Baptist himself. The tree that shown the royal English oak with the king's mark at the bottom near the roots the tree must bear good fruit, and if it doesn't, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire, according to the message of John the Baptist. The gospel is the fruit. Bringing pagan religions into it is not fruit. So with that warning to the people who have to pledge allegiance to the king during the ceremony, this is how the mark of the king, the royal cipher, the mark of the beast, which also incorporates not only the king's name, his title, his crown, and his number. Remember that I just showed you that the king was um, hammering, hand hammering the mark of the king that was the leopard head onto the cross that had the slivers of probably what I assume is the royal oak of the king tree. <laughs> that Christ was supposed to be crucified on those slivers that remain from the cross. And he was stamping with a hammer his royal mark, the leopard head, and I showed you how he is, how that leopard head transitioned from a lion with a crown into a leopard over time. He's the lion, the leopard, the uh, bear, and the dragon. I think this is a really appropriate scripture in Daniel 4.26. It says, The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means 
that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. So you have the king's royal cipher, his mark, the mark of the beast, the mark of a king, at the base near the roots of the tree. And John the Baptist gave that warning. So I'm going to have to pick up in another video. I'm going to leave you with this one. Uh, I've got a lot to cover, but this will be part one. I'll get back with you in the next part.